This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, it's Greg LeBlanc, and this is Unsiloed. I'm here today with Tom Vanderbilt, who is a uh, prolific journalist and also the author of a bunch of books. Uh, most recently, this book right here, it's called uh, Beginners, uh, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, right? Uh, which I really enjoyed. We're probably going to spend most of our time talking about that, but you've got some other books. Um, this book I read, I think it was like 12, 13 years ago or so. Uh, it's called uh, Traffic, yep. which I... I really, really enjoyed uh, this book uh, when it first uh, came out, um, you know, and I've made reference to it <laughs> on numerous occasions. Uh, and, you know, for some reason, I actually thought when I remember read this, I thought you were like a professor of of, of traffic science or something. It was so well, uh, it was just so well researched. I, 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 and I went looking for you to figure out what university you were at. So that was fantastic. And then this one also, which I really liked, is called uh, You May Also Like uh, taste in an age of endless uh, choice. Um, so I don't know whether we'll have a chance to, to talk about, you know, these books, because this one is just so rich and so interesting. Uh, and I think we could probably talk about it all day. So so welcome, Tom. Glad you could make it. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. So just to kick off this this book, right? Why? I mean, how do you get your book ideas? And in particular, how did you get this idea for, for this book? Had, did you presumably start writing the book after you had decided to undertake all of these uh, initiatives and uh, start learning chess with your daughter and so forth? Or uh, did you have this in the back of your mind that you were interested in the topic uh, before you, you started jumping into learning all these new things? Um, good question. Yeah. I mean, just, just in general, it is a very sloppy process. And sometimes, for example, with traffic, that was purely an accidental moment on, on a highway in the state of New Jersey, where I find myself now. Uh, but that, you know, then uncovered this strange world to me that was, you know, very familiar and all around us, but yet still seemed to contain a, a lot of mystery. And I was just flabbergasted by the amount of research I quickly found when I delved into a few simple topics. So that that book, you know, sort of presented itself in a, let's say, a eureka moment, uh, just quite accidentally. Um, beginners, you know, in a way, a similar thing, but there, there, as there is, are often with many books, there wasn't an article length treatment that sort of set it all off, um, which was this case of my daughter. Uh, she was four at the time. We were playing a game of checkers. She saw a chessboard. She wanted to play that game, which I thought was wonderful, except I didn't really know how to play. I'd never learned it, much to my kind of enduring shame um, because I, it intrigued me, the game, and I, I just you know never got around to it. Uh, so I wrote an article, and I, I was quite taken with the, the reaction to that and, and also the experience I had of, of learning this new thing, skill, endeavor, particularly at the same time as my, my daughter, who was a novice by, you know, four decades younger than me. Um, but it, it really seemed to tap into an interesting... Uh, thought, you know, strain of thought that people have about wanting to learn new things, about how to do that. Uh, I mean, chess, of course, went on to become much more popular. I didn't anticipate that because of the Queen's Gambit. Just got lucky there. But um, so, yeah, so I, it wasn't after that article came out and then I got a contract for the book that I then set out in earnest to learn all these things because they, they are very time consuming and it would have quickly bankrupted me if I just you know, started. Um, <laughs> surfing all day long uh, for fun and profit, <laughs> so to speak. Well, well, I think, I mean, the book, the book raises an interesting question, which is, um, you know, is when we talk about being good at something or bad at something, is it possible to be, say, you know, good at learning without being good at anything in particular? In other words, in, in, the, in the academic world, right, you know, we're dominated by specialists, Um in medicine, for instance, you know, you're dominated by specialists. Specialists tend to be the ones that get paid the most. And, and generalists are, are kind of looked down on. And, and I think you, you know, you, you talk about the origin of the word dilettante in, in, in the book a little bit. Um, but it, it seems like in today's world with things changing so rapidly, um, it, it's almost as if uh, the, the generalists are going to wind up taking over the world simply because by the time you become an expert in something that – field has kind of moved on. Is, is there, is there a, a sense that, um, you know, this idea of generalized learning is, is, is a skill uh, in and of itself independent of the subject matter that you're learning? 
And I ask this just because you're as a journalist, right? journalists yeah. are also like these, these generalists that, that, that are surfing from topic to topic and they have to get up to speed very quickly on them. And then, you know, as soon as they feel like they know something a lot about a topic, they wind up moving on to a completely different topic in ways that academics don't. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I don't actually know of, of research per se, but I, I do think it is sort of a muscle in that, you know, n knowing where to look, knowing how to look, knowing what to what to filter out, what information will probably not help you. You know, I myself have a have a, a sort of a short list of things I often do in the beginning of some kind of project, one of which, for example, would be uh, apart from talking to actual experts, but for example, something that a lot of people aren't familiar with outside of their field would be that that pro that uh, fields trade publications. I mean, to me, these are very obscure but fascinating repositories of all kinds of interesting information. You know, like there's Elevator World or two <laughs> magazines. There's two magazines about pallets, about shipping right. pallets. Um, <laughs> and you'd think it was the most boring thing in the world, but you open these pages and you, and you just, it sort of hits you like, wow, these people, there's a lot of people thinking, you know, a lot about the very hard problems here. Um, so that would be, you know, so I've, I've become very acute, you know, in, adept at, at knowing how to do that. Uh, I don't think when I started this book with beginners, which was a bit more about learning skills rather than information, mm -hmm. that I was a bit rusty, I think. And I would say rusty at the general skill of, of being a beginner. This is something um, I was just chatting about with a computer scientist named Peter Denning. You know, he, he had students, there'd be these cases where people who were quite adept at other types of technology would have to learn some sort of new uh, language or application and for a moment they were you know there was a deep unhappiness in that classroom mm -hmm. because all of these people who were quite used to being very competent were on equal footing as beginners and and you know probably some learned it a little bit quicker than others but just that just that general overall skill the the idea of being comfortable with not knowing with of being awkward of asking dumb questions that's something i think we do lose a little bit of a little bit of sight of as as let's say middle age adults. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a while since a lot of us have, have felt that, uh, you know, sometimes abject terror, I, I argue sometimes great pleasure at, at not knowing and, and sort of stumbling into something. So long winded question there, but, you, but you're right about specialization. I mean, there, perhaps what's happened is that, you know, technology and, and science keeps becoming more complex and specialization itself becomes a dead end because those specializations change so quickly that there's this phrase uh, people use called the perpetual novice in, in technology mm -hmm. that you're always on the edge of having to adapt anyway. So what's what's the use in drilling down into into one thing too much? And uh, Robert Root Bernstein has some some great research on this that David Epstein in his book Range, which is really about mm -hmm. great book about the subject you're asking about specialization, um, you know looks looks at these careers of Nobel Prize winning scientists. And he analyzed, and they were they were much more likely statistically to have been involved in a side pursuit, something like singing or, or being an amateur magician, anything you name it. They were more likely than than scientists that had not won the Nobel Prize. So he, you know, he's sort of making this interesting correlation there that maybe either those people were just sort of more open minded to begin with, open to experience, more creative, or they had brought something into their field from those side pursuits that, that ended up being useful. Uh, and it, you know, it can be hard to, to, to draw a line between those things, but it, but it is very suggestive, I think. Yeah, I remember reading a book uh, by Wayne Booth, I think it was 20 years ago or so, uh, about his, his, his literary critic and his love of uh, his learning of the cello. And he spent 40 years trying to oh, yeah. learn the cello and he could never get you know particularly good at it, but it was, it was something that was very central to his life. Um, you mentioned also there's a def definition, a difference between science and engineering, I think, somewhere in, in the book. Uh, uh, do you, you recall that? What, what, there was something about science being on the on the uh, perpetually not really knowing what it's doing and engineering, you really kind of have to know what you're doing? Yeah, that's a, a mathematician named Richard Hamming who uh, you know worked at Bell Labs and some other places, and he, he made this distinction. So scientists, yeah, science is about probing – what beyond what we already know and, and making, you know, hypotheses and, and, and plunging out in experimentation and looking for new data, trying to trying to confirm that data, but, you know, always beginning something, you know, not knowing how it's going to end up. Uh, so he said, you know, most of us, that applies to most of us in our daily careers. We're trying to be very, you know, competent and not make mistakes. I, I, I'm sorry, no, 
engineers is what we are in our daily career. So, yeah. so the distinction here is scientists are experimenting. Engineers, you know, really, if, if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it, as he said. Scientists, if you know what you're doing, you should not be doing it. So engineering, you know, if you, you can you can imagine as a, going back to traffic book as a driver, you're, you're on a road. You don't really want to be on a road that had an amateur engineer or, or even a, an experimental <laughs> engineer building that bridge. You really want the proven result, what we already know from the past. So, um, you know, in my book, I was sort of about, you know, becoming that scientist. And and this was all on, on the side for me. It wasn't, I mean, it was related to my career, obviously, because I was writing a book about it, but it wasn't going to, I wasn't going to have to make money off of any of these individual pursuits. Right. Um, it wasn't you know, writing, it wasn't writing lessons, you know, that you were taking, right? Right. And I wasn't going to become a ch professional chess player, you know, pr chess uh -huh. player or surfer. So I could just have fun if I, if I never became even halfway decent, that, that was fine too. But I, I could learn to separate performance from from pleasure and from other things I might take out of this activity, which, which were not always directly correlated to, to performance. I think that's a symptom of our age, that 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 cult of mastery of, you know, needing mm -hmm. to be good at something. And it particularly affects adults, I think, when they go into the learning process. This is something that distinguishes them from children who, you know, children learn in a very low pressure environment. It's been, it's been suggested this is one of the reasons they're so so adept at learning, but adults, you know, put all this immediate pressure on themselves. This, this, they don't want to look bad. They want to get good as soon as possible. They want to get out of that beginner stage. Who can blame them? But, um, but that pressure, I think, only inhibits the actual mm -hmm. uh, learning. Yeah, I think Jeff Bezos said that, um, you know, if you know the answer to the experiment, if you know how it's going to wind up, it's not an experiment, right? I mean, yeah, that's what the nature of science is. But um, but you may, you know, fear of failure is something that people in Silicon Valley, you know, people talk about fail fast, fail often, uh, and that's sort of the mantra out here. And and uh, and I think the reason why people have to say it so often is because it's it's not it's not something that people uh, grasp naturally. You talk a little about infants. Um, could you go back and and kind of review? You know, what is it so special about infants? I mean, they're falling down all the time. Uh, you know, and that's how how they're learning. Um. Yeah, I mean, it kind of gets this idea of, of you know, un, unstructured, unsupervised, un goal oriented learning. And I, I went to a place called the Infant Action Lab at NYU, <laughs> which is uh, run by a professor named Karen Adolph. And they, they, they're particularly interested in mobility, which is one of the key mm -hmm. things we learn in our first few years of life, along, along with language. And uh, these, things, these things are very essential to us. I mean, it's one thing to be a 50 year old trying to learn chess as, as sort of a pursuit or a hobby, you know, that is not crucial to my well-being on this planet. Uh, but if you're, a, you know, a young uh, infant, you know, communicating with your caregiver uh, or, or being able to move toward your caregiver, these are very important things. So I was fascinated, though, because there, there are all kinds of assumptions we might have about the way infants move and, and learn to move that, that for me, were, were overturned in this lab. I mean, one, for example, would be that babies would have very clear goals in their in their mobility like if you put a baby on one side of the room and their, their parent was on the other or there's a really good looking toy that they might really make a beeline for that toy but infants really have these random patterns of mobility that don't seem to have any clear purpose except to satisfy i think their own curiosity and they are just exploring and learning as they explore so i think mobility for them becomes an important means to learning more and you know there, there's even some question why an, an infant who's crawling quite well should want to walk. I mean, if, if in fact, my, our daughter took, she was about 18 months when she started walking, we were all getting a little bit nervous. And, um, and we sort of figured, well, we have a small Brooklyn apartment. I, why you know, walking isn't going to help that much. She can crawl from one side of the room to the other very quickly. So why bother with all this extra effort? But you know, the, the truth is, you can learn moving to that upright stance, you know, increases the, the amount of things you can see it lets you get places faster it lets you it brings you closer to the people you want to communicate mm -hmm. with so there's all these you know sort of hidden uh functional things behind walking um but you know the, another interesting thing is moving from crawling to walking all the things those infants learned as crawlers they don't really carry over into walking all, all the information about hazards for example so they'd have these great experiments at NYU where infants would crawl up this ramp 
and they'd get to the end of it and see, oh, it looks like a steep drop off, or or maybe they even w once went over it and learned it was a steep drop off. So they they become cautious, but then as walkers, they'll just you know plunge, the, they'll sort of walk toward the edge and. Right. And, and I was sort of asking, wouldn't it be useful for them to maintain this information about hazard? And, and Dr. Adolph was saying that, you know, that would get in the way of the learning process you, you, because they are, they are now moving with a different body. It's a different exercise. It's a different type of mobility. So they need to learn mm -hmm. all over again. They're, they're basically learning how to learn, as, as the phrase goes, which comes from uh, Harlow, a, a famous you know, re, a primate researcher. But um, and that, yeah, so I just... Found there were a lot of a lot of sort of you know things I could learn or we all could learn from the way those infants were learning. Mm -hmm. That was really you know again low pressure, not often clear goals, changing up your practice very often. Not not just doing the same drills, but but doing things in a completely spontaneous, random fashion. Um, and as you mentioned, learning how to fail. I mean the the number of falls that an infant takes in an hour is staggering, and I. Did a piece for uh, the Wall Street Journal, which was about you know sort of sort of related to the book, and the editor saw this figure of up to seventy falls per hour, and 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 also the distance infants walk, mm -hmm. which can be like you know I forget what it is, uh, four or five football fields in an hour, and they said that can't be right. You have to go back to Dr. Adolph and and get the right figure. So, mm -hmm. so I duly did this, and turns out that is the recorded, you know validated peer-reviewed data that was out there so um a lot of walking and a lot of falling so i was wondering if you could talk a bit about you know the way in which young people learn versus older people um you know when you were learning to play chess alongside your daughter i think she was outpacing you uh pretty pretty quickly um and so a lot of people say that for certain things kids can learn much more quickly like with languages and so forth i think we as adults can probably if we needed to learn a lot about, you know, the science of traffic could probably, you know, learn that much more quickly than, than say a young person. Um, what are the main differences in, in terms of um, the, these learning capacities, learning styles, and are they inevitable or can we somehow go back and re retrieve some of the um, advantages that, that we may have had as younger learners? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's a couple differences which we should probably break into, let's say, lifestyle differences. I mean, number one, kids just have a lot of free time, right, to do nothing but learn. Uh, adults don't have all day to do this generally. So when we when we hear about this tremendous progress that young kids make in something like language or music, you know, you sort of have to look at the actual number of hours they're devoting to that. I mean, many, many a chess grandmaster as a teen or young adult spent hours you know bobby fisher was just in his room playing games against himself i mean no no adult that i know has that kind of time so you know so there's the lifestyle factor is huge but then cognitively you know i think children definitely have more of a uh you know tendency toward what's been called fluid intelligence sort of fast uh problem solving quick responses uh whereas adults tend to have more crystallized knowledge which is is what you might call wisdom accumulated facts and memories and in a game like chess you know this my daughter would have an advantage i think against the clock playing you know or playing these short games which are called blitz games um she didn't really wasn't concerned with opening strategy or, or these things that i was immediately interested in because having played a lot of games in my life i was sort of like well you know how do you win what are the, what's the strategy kids just sort of play move by move and they don't really think too long about the move they're making, nor do they really regret the move they made. And they just plunge on sort of like those infants, you know, bumbling about the NYU, uh, you know, laboratory, you know, the truth is that they're often quite good. And they just are just, I think, do, you know, going back to that scientist versus engineers, they're, they're scientists, they're, they're just testing, you know, mm -hmm. these hypotheses about how they might get, get better. And uh, so, you know, I, I, but Going back one more time to the lifestyle thing, though, you know, my daughter would play a game of chess and then have to analyze it with her coach, which is very important. This is mm -hmm. this is part of deliberate practice, as it's known. The famous uh, theory espoused, you know, in part by Anders Ericsson, the psychologist, that if you had ten thousand hours of that deliberate practice, you would you might reach expert level uh, performance. I found, uh, and and many chess players I've talked to find, you know, the analysis a little bit 
you know, it's like doing your homework. It can be a little bit boring. You mm-hmm. just want, you, you, it's more fun to just play, play again, you, whether, you know, and you don't take as much away from those games. You're not really analyzing the game. So my daughter in some ways was progressing more because she was engaging in more deliberate practice because her coach made her. Mm-hmm. Whereas left to my own devices, I was just trying to get better through sheer brute force play, you know, play multiple games, which I, I think her strategy was, was, you know, much better, which is why she became a better player. And to this day is, I think, I mean, we, you know, we can, I can still give her a good battle, but, um, you know, I think rating, rating wise, she's ahead of me. <laughs> of course the kids don't, when they're learning to walk, they don't have any coaches. They don't have any uh, teachers, right? They're, they're just, uh, you know, learning through their own experimentation. Um, Exactly, which you know, they do have a su- very supportive audience, of course, and you know that and that's mm-hmm. important too. But again, that that lack of pressure, no one is is really you know expect them to get to get better at a certain rate. They can just uh, th- there's a corollary here with you know uh, that sort of mindless walking that was happening in NYU. There's there's the way that, uh, children babble, and I was I was talking to a psychologist who was trying to learn German, and she had engaged in a little bit of of adult babbling in German because it's a way to really help mm-hmm. particularly with the accent, because these are sounds that you're not, you're simply not used to making as let's say a 40 something adult who's been speaking English their whole life. And this is again, one of those challenges that that is a bit harder for the adult learner because, you know, if I were to try to learn German tomorrow, I have now five decades of English grammar and maybe some Spanish grammar getting in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas a kid hearing it for the first time, it's just something else that their, you know, neural architecture can, can just gobble up. There's nothing getting in the way of that. This has been called the less is more hypothesis because Mm -hmm. children actually have less (laughs) that they've already learned. It makes learning new things a more efficient process. And I I use the metaphor of, you know, an old lumbering PC with it with an old hard drive filled with many years of of documents. And, And you go to Someone asks you, oh, you know, my, my wife and I are always doing this. Like, what, what was that movie with um, what's his name? And you're sort of and you're sort of scratching your head. And it's like, I've seen so many films. I've, I know yeah. so, names of so many actors. I, I'm going through that hard drive, and it, you know, it might take me you know an hour. But uh, but there's there's a lot of other information that we have to overcome, mm-hmm. a lot of muscle memory, a lot of things like that, which makes learning new things a bit less fluid. I think that than for children. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you didn't exactly quote Yoda, but I think you, you made the point that uh, a lot of learning requires um, unlearning, right? And that uh, when you enter into certain activities, you have to to become better. You have to strip away some of the, the unconscious habits that you might have or uh, redirect your attention away from the uh, automatic attention that you might have or pre-existing theories. Uh, you took up drawing, you took up juggling, um, could you talk a bit about that? How, how did you um, kind of refocus and, and relearn uh, these, these or undo these assumptions that got in the way of learning these new tasks? Sure. And I, mean, it, it, I was curious, is there a Yoda quote about unlearning? I'm, I'm not sure I know that one. I know there is, <laughs> I think, there is no do, there is, there's no try, there is do, but... Uh, yeah, I think there is a Yoda well, quote. It's like, Yoda must if, if there is an actual <laughs> Maybe, all right. Yeah, you must le- unlearn to learn or no, something Yoda like that. No, Yoda is a spirit. <laughs> no, y- Yoda is definitely a spirit guide in, in all of this um, stuff. But yeah, I mean, I mean, number one, um, with something like juggling, to th- th- there's a natural impulse, I think, especially for beginners, to try to pay attention to everything going on in the moment. Mm-hmm. And you have this idea that that's how you juggle, that you're, you're throwing these three balls in the air and somehow you're, you're keeping track of each of them individually, literally. And that really is not how juggling works. Rather, instead, we throw to patterns. And this was a constant struggle for me. I kept trying to focus on individual balls. And, and, my, and my daughter, even the first time I tried to teach her to juggle, was doing exactly the same thing. And, and it quickly overwhelms you because you can't really track those three balls at once. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, you can throw to a, a single point in the sky and you have a peripheral awareness of those balls, but um, so that's that's the kind of unlearning that coaches are constantly trying to instill in people. You know, like not to, you know, not not to look where you're, you're on a surfboard, not to look at the at the nose of your surfboard, but to look where you want to go, as they say, and the body will sort of magically uh, do the rest. Um, 
something like singing, I found that you know, the act of, act of talking, which obviously we all do much of much of our lives, um, it, it, you know, we, we try to act that way in singing sometimes, and we bring in sort of the wrong musculature or the wrong approach, and that can get in the way. And those sorts of things had to be unlearned for me in singing. I, I wanted to sort of plunge right into immediately just just you know belting out songs, but even how to pronounce words, pronounce sung words, which is a very different thing than pronouncing spoken words. Uh, that, that, that was a whole skill I had to learn. So a lot of our initial work in, in vo voice lessons was, you know, simply making these very elemental vowel type sounds and, and breaking things down and kind of, almost like getting to the, 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 the fundamentals of, of music and with, with, you know, your, as your vo with your voice being an instrument and, and trying to you know, almost make yourself machine-like. Um, that, that's kind of a metaphor I, I saw in a lot of these things, is, is trying to get yourself out of the way of what you mm -hmm. were trying to learn and become instead, you know, a learning machine that was just adopting whatever algorithm it was rather than doing a lot of active thinking on your own because that active thinking often gets in the way of motor skill activity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would use the example of, of walking. If any of you... You know, listening went out after after this and, and tried to think about how you're walking and, and analyze your walking as you were doing it and wonder how I could get better at walking. That itself is going to sort of mess up your walking, uh, the, the, you know, because we've internalized it, we've made it automatic, mm -hmm. we've actually stopped devoting neural space to that. Um, there's there's a fascinating thing that happens when you learn a new skill, like like let's say beginner readers. The certain the certain network of the brain is is really activated and lit up for, for a little while, and then as as we get better, all that activity begins to calm down, and it never gets back to that unless you do something like uh, with with reading, for example. If you did one of those experiments where you stripped out a lot of the letters in, in, a, in a paragraph, let's say, and and you're still trying to, you know, when you, when you have to work again, that's when all those act, those uh, regions become activated again. But otherwise, it's purely automatic, purely automatic behavior that we've we're, we're kind of coasting around on autopilot for most of the things we do, which, which is good because otherwise we'd be overwhelmed and our brains would always be hurting. Which I will say, this is one thing that definitely dominated my experience of trying to learn all these things. Often, that I just really had you know, he, you know headaches and, and fatigue. I mean, this is. Um, <laughs> And, and this is that, that kind of thing when, when you feel frustrated and, and it, it feels like you're not getting it and it, it literally is hurting your head, that's when you're learning. You know, when it's effortless and, you know, then you've already learned it and it's the moment is gone, you've made it automatic and maybe it's time to try something new. But there is definitely a pain <laughs> attached. I interviewed Dan Willingham earlier this week and he's an expert on, on reading. And he said that, you know, when you first start to read, you, you have to... Um, you know, read uh, phonetically, and uh, it's then only later that you uh, can can learn um, using. Uh, I mean, you can read like entire words, um, and uh, and so your eye kind of starts to move much more quickly over the page. Um, and so one of the points that he had made was that if you try to teach early readers to read like late readers, then they don't really learn how to read. Because when you're a beginner, you do things differently than when you're you're an expert. Um, so you had said in the book that you know Lionel Messi would make a terrible uh, soccer teacher. Um, uh, is there a difference between being good at something and and being able to to teach it? Yeah, I mean, and all fairness to Lionel, he, maybe he maybe he actually could be a good teacher, but but. Which is to say, though, that, that the teaching aspect is a different skill than the playing aspect. And, and I, I would guess, and it's, I mean, it's been shown through experience that a lot of a lot of superstar athletes, you know, it, they're so far removed from those moments when they were just learning, which may have been as mm -hmm. children, that for them to go back and analyze those first steps would be, yeah, I mean, it'd be, be impossible. Because they, I mean, this is the thing we were just kind of talking about with walking. There's that initial moment where you have to break down all these individual steps it's called chunking you know and then mm -hmm. and that's why beginners are so clumsy because you know, me on a surfboard i'm like okay um there's a wave coming you know, i have this checklist in my head of 10 things i'm supposed to do and I'm, I'm running that off of my head which slows me down and then i might miss item number three or six 
that slightly screws it up. Mm-hmm. You know, Lionel Messi does not have a checklist of, of how to score a goal. He's just, you know, thinking intuitively and his, his right. you know, brain and body are moving very quickly. So, but, it, but in the beginning, that, that checklist sort of is the way we have to learn and the, and the way things have to be taught. So there's a, yeah, there's an interesting argument that, you know, people can learn better from watching the error-filled efforts of fellow novices or maybe even intermediate performers. Because it, it's just, it's almost, uh, I guess it's, if you're learning to, learning to speak a new language, you don't start in by watching a film, you know, where there's going to be a lot of rapid speaking and slang. Mm-hmm. You know, you start with those sort of very simple sounding, slowly spoken exercises, because um, otherwise you'll, you'll lose the plot. And some of it, I think, is just, is just time and, and speed. Mm-hmm. But then your your juggling instructor, she admitted that she was not a very good juggler, and uh, and and maybe that was what made her a good juggling instructor. And it, you know, in, in the university environment, we have uh, people that are extraordinarily sophisticated and good at what they do, and yet they're thrust into the position of having to teach it. Um, and uh, and often that means you know they have, they have they have a great deal of difficulty, and oftentimes I think the topics can be taught better by people who either aren't <laughs> as as good at it or who have maybe more recently learned it. Uh, and I think the whole Montessori approach to teaching is that you know the third graders teach the second graders who teach the first graders, uh, and mm-hmm. and it seems to be very effective. Yeah, I could see that, and in fact, I recently. Um... My daughter had an exercise for her school uh, where she had to draw something and she had a, a photograph of our cat and she was trying to draw it and she came to me and asked for some advice about it. And of course I got a little bit overzealous and ended up basically taking control of the project. And uh, <laughs> I don't mean to brag, but of course then they wanted to display the work in the school and I sort of had to explain to the teacher that I actually helped a little bit with that. But 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 it, I'm not saying I'm an amazing artist, but what I found very satisfying was I was teaching her what I had learned. This is sort of yeah. an obvious thing, but it, but I think we we forget about it, or we don't have as many chances to to do this as we might like. That that's a powerful way to kind of close the the feedback mm-hmm. loop there too. Um, I guess in medical school they say something like uh, "see one, do one, teach one." You know, it, it just mm-hmm. helps cement all those things you're still grappling with yourself. And the, if you can explain it to someone else, then that just you know reaffirms it in your own brain i think and it helps you become better at that thing yourself i I guess that's been talked about in terms of like things like reading comprehension Mm -hmm. um as a way to you know if you're reading a difficult text a good exercise is you know can you actually explain it to someone else or or even yourself rather than just regurgitating it um and so so yeah i uh uh, and teaching is something that i think can be done even at the even at the lowest levels of your own progress. I mean, if, if you've, if you, you know, in juggling, let's say three ball juggling is, is the entry point to what's considered juggling. Uh, but a lot of people don't know how to do that. So after a week, if you can become a three ball juggler, you now have the capacity to teach other people mm-hmm. how to three ball juggle and you'll probably become better for that. Mm-hmm. So do you think there's still a role for the, the coach or the teacher? I, I, you know, a lot of people have been penned up by the, pandemic and presumably a lot of people have taken up all sorts of new hobbies and and uh and and uh challenges but they've done so primarily maybe by watching youtube videos um is is there a difference between having a a coach uh, and a trainer and a teacher versus uh kind of teaching yourself through through youtube or uh, uh you know reading a training manual or how to book yeah, I think so. I mean, it sort of depends on what the activity is. I mean, some things are very, very, let's say, I think rigid as they've been described. And, you know, chess is a very you know, ordered world that, you know, if, if you do online puzzles, or, for example, there, there's there's one best reply in that puzzle, and that's what they're looking for. There, there's not like 20 different, it's not, it's not, it's not a subjective. So it, it's very easy to analyze yourself using the new chess engines and things like that which is not to say a coach isn't still very useful but contrast that to something like singing where you're trying to gain control of this set of muscles that you can't even actually see yourself it's not like a golf uh, a golf uh, swing or a tennis mm-hmm. stroke um, knowing how to produce that set of sounds and then knowing whether you're actually producing them is something that the feedback that a, a coach 
and and my vo- voice coach was was you know sometimes almost peering down my throat. I felt like to really to really just sort of analyze what I was doing and how how I could position my body better. And it's not to say that this stuff couldn't be done online. And uh, I guess even there, there's a distinction. You know, is it an online course with a live instructor or is it a recorded class? I, I think both of those things have their their benefit. But, but for some activities, the live coaching is definitely the way to go. And there are and people also have different personality types. I which is not, I'm not talking about learning styles, which is the, that's sort of a myth that's been discredited in, in many articles, the idea of like a kinesthetic learning sense, or I'm, I'm a visual learner. It, it's more about, you know, are, are you a good autodidact? I, th- I think I am with certain things, but for many things, I, I really rely quite heavily on, on coaches or just people who know what they're doing. I find that to be a very, for me, a faster route to learning than trying to, you know, hack through it myself online. But again, I think that that could be just down to personality. So a lot of the things that you reference, whether it's, you know, learning uh, sports or, or learning drawing or, or learning music, um, I think at, at one point, and maybe in some mythical past, those were all part of uh, formal young person's education, right? So, um, I mean, I remember when I was in school, we had we had shop and we had, uh, you know, PE and we had, um, you know, music and we had art. We had sewing and cooking and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, I think a lot of those things have been uh, questioned as uh, maybe not so useful in today's world. And there's a lot of pressure uh, for students to acquire, you know, whether it's STEM education and uh, make sure they get good test scores and uh, certainly at the liberal arts education level, there's a lot of pressure for students to take things that are considered practical and uh, more job oriented. Uh, do you do you think there's something lost um, when we kind of strip those things out or, or are they compensated for by uh, external pursuits that young people are going to do no matter what? Uh, is there is there some... I mean, this this is a um, this is not the subject matter of your book, but I'm just wondering if you did kind of reflect on how um, maybe John Ruskin said everybody needed to know how to draw, and and you talk a little bit about how you know singing was something that pretty much everybody knew how to do, it was sort of a communal activity, that, but now no one does it anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, and it reminds me of there's a, a great moment in a Robert Heinlein um, story, the science fiction writer, where he he he, he lists this list of things that humans should be able to do. And it's, it's a kind of a crazy list of things like plan an invasion, change a diaper. I mean, it's, it's very wide ranging and, and a bit, a bit farcical, but, but that, there's also a point there where I think, you know, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned shop class, which I myself, I think I had one semester of, but in terms of, you know, practicality or employment, I mean, looking around me at the economy right now, if you were, just try to hire you know, an electrician right now at, at this moment. I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible. I mean, they're, they're, they talk about a, a career that's in demand, um, yet, I mean, it's, so it's, it's a bit maybe off topic of what you asked, but um, but the, you know, it, it makes me think of as we're steering kids constantly into these you know sort of STEM careers, how there's some just other fundamental roles that are out there that, um, uh, you know, and I myself wish I had learned a bit more of that stuff when I was, growing up to, to, to the point now where I can't actually change the oil in my own car, uh, which is, you know, this incredibly complex computer uh, driven uh, thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, things like, like drawing, I mean, there's at least to have some exposure to it. And it, it, it doesn't take that long to gain a certain facility with drawing. It's just a way to, you know, be able to, to record, uh, you know, the, the world around us in, in 2D, I think has, has a practical application of, of, it's another way of looking at the world, it's another way of understanding mm-hmm. the world, it, it teaches focus and concentration and, and can be quite useful for, you know, all, all, all sorts of things. Um, singing, you know, is, is a interesting, I mean, there, there's some funny research I came across from the Royal Conservancy in, in Toronto, uh, in Canada, showing that, um, you know, because a lot of parents are very obsessed with music lessons and having their kids learn piano or violin because that will help them become geniuses. Uh, they actually showed that the study showed that voice students 
uh, ended up having a higher improvement in IQ than than piano or, or <laughs> uh, cello or, or violin, whatever it was. But um, so maybe there's an argument that singing makes you smarter. But I, I'm not making that argument. I just think it's a a great you know social human mm-hmm. impulse that we've sort of let slide a little bit because of this this great kind of social desire for mastery and this exposure that we now have via mass media music itself went from a productive um, object to a consumptive object for for the large part whereas you know people used to have to do their own musical entertaining in their own homes it was a form of language really you know now we can just turn on the radio and hear you know the Mm -hmm. world's greatest singers but i think something's been lost there you know is, is it a is it an educational thing? I'm not sure. It just seems like part of it, going back to Robert Heinlein, it just seems like something we should, we should know that we should be able to carry a tune and, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, celebrate this wonderful social experience you can have by, by singing with others. Um, I mean, that's just my own personal opinion, of course, but it's, it's brought me an immense amount of pleasure. And I, I sort of I'm kicking myself w- with all these things that I waited so long to you know, get around yeah. to, to doing them. But. but, but I mean, the question that people would ask you is sort of, you know, what's it for? Right. I mean, <laughs> you, you mentioned that kind of, I think the, the long arm of the job and how, you know, everything you do is supposed to be in the service of your, your employment or, you know, becoming that master of whatever it is that is your, is your vocation. Um, none of these things seem to really, you know, learning how to surf doesn't really seem to, this is not making you a better journalist, right? I mean, what, what, what's the, what's it for? Why, why, why learn all this stuff? Yeah. It makes me think of this funny quote from, I can't think of the person's name, but he's a, he's a historian who wrote about hobbies in America, which had a very interesting history, you know, going back, uh, especially around the, the depression when a lot of people were put out of work and had to do other things. But, he, you know, he says, hobbies basically turn leisure into work and work mm-hmm. into leisure. Um, so there's, you know, mm-hmm. you're always sort of operating on that, that fine line of, of something. And if you get really good at something, then you're sort of tempted to maybe try to commoditize it, to turn it into mm-hmm. a, you know, a side hustle a, a, as we say, um, which then another group, another school of thought resists that and says, you know, well, you don't, you don't have to monetize everything that you, know, maybe that corrupts the, the pleasure. Um, yeah. In my own, Again, uh, I just thought it was it was not resume building. It, it was sort of this life resume building where I just I, I felt like I was it's not that I was coming from a deep position of unhappiness. I, I just felt that there was a, a lack of experience that was going on because I had restricted myself to either sticking with the things I already knew how to do and had learned a long time ago or were, were essentially just sticking with work. I mean, that, that, and that's a very easy thing to do in, in the today's mm-hmm. world. You know, pe- people don't really, you know, criticize you for being busy or for being devoted uh to your job but to my mind there was this i i felt i had done enough of that and it's not like i i can't still make professional growth in in writing but you know sort of like the, the peggy lee song is is that all there is so i i wanted to you know kind of go to this other part and it, again purely self-interested i can't say that i'm like it's making the world better or anything but i i think this is an argument we've seen with, with the pandemic, you know, people, people wonder about the so-called, you know, self-care is, is that a selfish act? But, you know, I think the argument is that if you can't, if you don't feel good about yourself, you're not going to, you know, be any, any use to the world. So, um, I don't know that it's kind of a rambling answer, but, um, again, well, that, that's kind of, where, between, yeah. you make a distinction between process and, and product and, and how, you know, so many of us, we, we, we evaluate our um, activity based on some benchmark, right? You know, did I get the four minute mile or, or whatever, uh, rather than, you know, did, how much did I learn? And, and obviously you're going to learn more when you try to do things you're bad at than maybe try and uh, incrementally improve what you're already good at. Um, do you think that uh, I've, I've spoken to some other folks who have uh, bemoaned the hyper competitiveness of, the activities that they have their kids participate in, right? So like the soccer league tournaments where, you know, if you're not doing it 18 hours a day, then you're never going to make the local uh, team. And, and, uh, and, and so just doing, doing it for the fun of it is something that seems to be 
uh, kind of squeezed out of our, our children's lives, um, except in certain, you know, small communities. I was speaking to someone who was a professor at Dartmouth and he said that, you know, at least in Hanover, um, you know, you can be the captain of the team without having to really you know, be very good, uh, which is not true in, in other parts of the country. Um, do you think we kind of, if, cause if you think about the kids who are learning to walk, you know, they're doing it in a very unpressured way. Uh, you know, when you think about kids learning other things, they're doing it, you know, for fun and there's, there's enjoyment in it. Can we, can we kind of strip out the fun if we make it too kind of end goal oriented or product oriented and then crush the motivation that might be there? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I think this is something that, you know, the, the, there, there's a turning of the tide of opinion about somewhat, I think, although although a lot of people are still practicing it and are, are devoted to it. I'll go back to that book by David Epstein again, Range, which, you know, looks at some of these star now star performer athletes that 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 weren't playing. You know, Roger Federer was not playing only tennis at a very young age. He was doing a lot of other things and then sort of grew into eventually finding himself in, in tennis. And you see that the, the, the prodigy is actually a very rare thing. And that, I mean, I've seen, let's just say in the chess world, the New York City scholastic competitive chess world is very competitive. And I've seen immense amount of pressure poured upon children by parents, ostensibly well-meaning, after a match had concluded, you know, just badgering them about why they, why they had lost. And these are parents that actually don't know how to play the game themselves, which I find, uh, a, you know, a bit strange. So I think, yeah, and that, that um, impulse, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of the joy out of it for kids. And this has been cited in research that a lot of children are turning away from youth participation in sports because they're, they're burned out or they're not, they're not feeling the pleasure. And it's, if it's not, if they're not, if it's not going to be their career, why are they investing so much you know, time and effort in that and yeah i myself i don't think we ever lose that that desire to compete and i i mentioned in the book how i became obsessed with with road cycling and that that was sort of a one-way trip to just always trying to get better and there's there's a quote from uh, greg lamont the, the famous you know cyclist it, it never gets easier you just go faster and at, you know at first i sort of took that ethos to heart and i was just okay and you start out at category five, then you get better, you're at category four, then three, then two, then one. And each of those leaps, though, it immense more amount of time is, is required and effort. I just found that I was, you know, quickly burning out. And I, I found more pleasure coming from trying new things and not investing so much time ahead of time in, in trying to get good and trying to train. So, I, for example, I, I ran the New York City Marathon on a bit of a a bit of a lark. A friend asked me to do it for a charity thing, and I, I did a few of the training runs that you're supposed to do, but I never really did the whole schedule. And you, you know, you're, you're almost supposed to run the exact marathon before you run the marathon. And to me, that I didn't like the spirit of that. I, I didn't want to just, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want the day of the marathon to just be like running the same carefully calibrated ru ru uh, run I'd already done. I wanted to, there to be this sort of you know, mystery. I wanted it to be sort of an epic quest. Like, could I actually do it? So, uh, of course, I blew up around mile 16, and then it was sort of, you know, running and walking a little bit and, and basically limped to the end. I mean, I did okay, but it wasn't, no, it was nothing amazing. I could have done better had I done many more months of training, but to my mind, it, it was an unforgettable experience, you know, just being pushed to the absolute wall and, and going beyond the limits of what I knew because I only knew half marathons. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure I could even finish the marathon at all. Obviously, a lot of people are going to take issue with this. And, you know, they, they people like to train and they take great pride in running the fastest they can. But to, but to me, there was a, this, this was another approach that I found at least equally valid. Mm -hmm. Well, so on the other hand, uh, and, you know, it's important to have positive motivation and enjoyment and fun. But you also mentioned that um, if you're not uncomfortable, you're, you're probably not learning. Uh, and there's a great deal of, of, of discomfort and dissatisfaction and frustration that comes along with learning. And if you're not experiencing that, that means you're probably uh, stagnating. Um, you know, on the flip side of, of, of raising children, do you think that um, 
trying to provide too comfortable of an environment for people? Do you think that the pursuit of comfort, the pursuit of, uh, I think, uh, I, f- I forget what you, you, you referred to it as, but this, you know, plateau, uh, mm-hmm. of, of, of comfort and ease, uh, is, is ultimately going to get in the way of us improving and, and becoming better and having our, our kids get better. Is there an optimal level of, of discomfort and, and fun right, to, to, to be optimal learners? Well, I mean, I think there is. And uh, there's a psychologist who called uh, Robert Bjork who calls this desirable difficulty that, you know, it should, mm-hmm. it should, we should always sort of, and this is, goes back to the infants. The infants are always trying to do something that's a little bit out of their grasp, but, and, and that's mm-hmm. why they're failing. But then eventually they, they, uh, do get there. And, um, uh, I'm sorry, I totally just lost my train of thought. I had a point I was going to make there. Uh, can, you, can you remind me of your original question? So uh, what, is there an optimal level of, of, of discomfort, right? I mean, oftentimes to get to that yeah. point where you feel exhilaration uh, in the learning process, you have to go through yeah. some, some, you know, some, some discomfort, some negative feedback, some frustration, um, some right, difficulties. Right. Yeah, so there's two things that, that came to mind, which is one, um, a study by, by Julia Leonard and, and colleagues, which was um, – having these uh, adult subjects do these sort of um, kind of simple puzzles, but have them do them for uh, infants or very young children. And there's an interesting finding that happens that, um, you know, if adults struggle uh, and and solve it, the the more they struggle and solve it, the more likely kids will spend more time trying that same puzzle. Mm. Whereas if the adults sort of give up right away or never solve Mm -hmm. it or, or solve it right away, uh, the kids seem less likely uh, to want to, you know, put that time in. And the, uh, Dr. Leonard told me that it was a bit tricky setting up the experiment sometimes because there would be parents in the room and parents wouldn't like to see their kids struggle and they would sort of step in and solve the mm-hmm. thing for them. <laughs> it was yeah. just like, um, so that, that's sort of an impulse. And, and I think we see this, a lot of parents out there have probably, try to get their kids to ride bikes and put them on bikes with training wheels because that seems like a, a noble way, you know, for them to learn to ride a bike. And I, I, I did this myself and I found something interesting is that, you know, my daughter took to the training wheels very easily and, and was suddenly going really fast. But then, so she, she was you know doing what quote unquote well at riding a bike, but then she would take a turn and was taking it because she didn't really understand what the dynamics of the bike were because she was, because she was on these training wheels she took the turn too fast and wiped out. So, mm-hmm. you know, in trying to cushion her whole experience of learning to ride a bike, I'd actually set her up for a larger failure. Mm-hmm. So I quickly switched, as a lot of people now do, to what's called a balance bike, you know, which is just a bike with no pedals. They sort of push along, and mm-hmm. but they can feel the whole sense of, you know, the mm-hmm. proprioception and the, and the balance. And it just, it's, it's a little more challenging in the beginning, but there's a more active learning process yeah. going on there. And then the minute you get them on a real bike, I mean the the learning transition is yeah. almost you know negligible at that point. So uh, I think that that, but that's that desirable difficulty again that you know making it just a little bit challenging and, and giving giving them the real experience. Not it's like uh, in the pool putting water wings on kids. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not a way to teach them how to you know it, it's a band aid. It's not going to teach them how to what the water is like or how to swim. But we often want to do that for our kids or even for ourselves, give ourselves those, those cushions because it, it feels yeah. better. <laughs> so I've, I've seen studies that in, in, um, uh, kind of less advanced, uh, countries, uh, the children are allowed to participate in the cooking and, uh, meaning they're, they're using knives and they're exposed to fire and, and they're, and you know, they're doing this at a young age. Whereas I think when American parents have their kids, you know, cooking, they'll see them screw up and they'll just go in and say, look, just, you know, get out of here, go, leave, you know, I'll take care of it. Uh, and then they, they never actually learn to, uh, uh, to imitate and learn to associate this activity with, with, uh, with, as an enjoyable challenge. They are just taught that they're, they're no good at it. And so they should just stay away. Yeah, that's a great point. I was just, um, actually, Dr. Leonard was just bringing up some of those studies, uh, among, among the Maya, these, these studies were, but, um, and this, yeah, I mean, kids just being immersed in the, it's kind of like goes back to babbling or, you know, they're learning how to do things simply by, by being there and, and looking and, and learning and listening, not, not being, not being like taught in a structured way, but just trying it out. And, and, uh, mm-hmm. and this, you know, speaks to it. 
very important part of the of the human learning mechanism, I think, which is that imitative aspect. I mean, we we really there's this whole uh, wonderful part of uh, of the brain. It's been dubbed the action observation network that really lights up when we watch something, someone do something. Especially lights up when when we're expected to have to do that thing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's just we, we we're very keen at picking up from other people's uh, behavior. And this, I think, as you mentioned YouTube before, why that has become such an, an effective learning source. I myself just uh, the other night bought an Ikea desk for my daughter. And the, rather than go through the whole instruction manual, I just found someone who had, had posted a YouTube video step by right. step. And I just basically in, you know, almost like ape-like fashion, I was just mimicking <laughs> what he was doing, which – if, if you, you know, this is one of the learning styles that actually is true mm -hmm. that, you know, you can learn a lot better simply by watching someone mm -hmm. than, than reading a set of instructions. I mean, I, I, I could argue that right now and that that is a fundamental distinction. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> are, are you familiar with this thing called the marshmallow challenge? Uh, it was designed oh, yes, by about, a guy. About, uh, patience and, and no, no, this is a different. It was designed by a guy. Guy at Autodesk, and it's it's essentially one. It's like a something I do in my design thinking workshops, where you give people you know pasta and marshmallows, and they have to build a tower in a finite period of time. And it turns out that um, business people are really really bad at it. You know what they'll do is they'll they'll design something on paper, and then they'll build this thing, and then at the very end, when the timing runs out, the whole thing collapses. And uh, it's apparently kindergartners are better at it than, than MBAs. And it's because they, they fail multiple times because they, they, they don't understand the, the tensile properties of pasta and marshmallows, whereas the MBAs assume that they understand the tensile properties of these things. Uh, and, uh, and so they wind up, you know, having these disastrous <laughs> failures and, and, and the kids will, you know, just incrementally uh, learn all about the properties of these materials and thereby they succeed in building these larger towers. And, uh, and I thought, you know, at some point people forget how to learn or they, they assume that they, they know what they don't know, uh, when confronted with something that's novel. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And it also it speaks to how experience can, can get in the way. And that, I mean, I've seen the phrase, uh, you know, with the famous candle problem, which is similar to what you're describing, where yeah. people have to, you know, engineer this solution, but people get hung up on the, what you know, the so-called functional fixedness and adults mm -hmm. with a lot of experience would, would sort of have a certain set of thoughts about pasta or marshmallow, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, kids would be very fresh to these things and could yeah. look at them freshly. And this is the whole concept of, of beginner's mind. You know, how can you, how can we as adults, you know, engineer that, that thought in, in that, that sort of way of being in ourselves. And it, it, it is very, uh, challenging and it just is one of the cases where I mean generally experience is a is a positive thing and, and embodied you know knowledge and and, and a mass knowledge but when when novelty is what's actually called for and this is kind of the secret I think to some of these um, crowdsourcing solutions like Kaggle where people are brought in you know there's a challenge posted I need to you know figure out how to track every flight in the world how, how can i do that something, something like that and then mm -hmm. the call goes out and it could, and people from radically different fields sometimes weigh in with very innovative solutions uh you know based on the, because they, they don't in a way that they don't know what can't be done in mm -hmm. that field because they're not in that field they, they just know you know uh so i think you know obviously in a, in a something like a corporate situ situation it might be best to have a mixture of people you know yeah. both both beginner's mind and deeply experienced and, and see what, you know, what, what the result could be. But, um, but I hadn't seen that particular study. I, and of course, when you said marshmallows, I was thinking about the, the children's Michelle. Yeah. About, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'll send, I'll send you a link to it. Um, I think right. the most, most interesting metaphor or example that you provided that um, I continually go back to is this idea that if you're, if you're trying to, if you're a beginner and you're trying to draw a face, uh, it's easier to actually um, copy uh, this image upside down because when it's upside down, you don't have that pre-existing notion of what a face is supposed to look like. So I thought that was very, very powerful. Yeah. And that, that, that really is, you know, sort of a metaphor, I think for how much of, uh, you know, Lisa uh, Feldman Barnett calls this, you know, the predictive brain, how, how much, mm -hmm. you know, we sort of walk around every day, 
you know, almost living in this, in this model of what we think the world looks like and, and, and sort of is because, you know, the, it, it makes life easier. We don't have to, you know, you don't want to try to analyze every moment of our, our life, but but can be a problem when asked to do something like draw and to really see someone's nose the way it is rather than than a quote unquote nose that mm -hmm. is this pre-existing we have, we have almost have sort of a pattern matching algorithm in our head of what a nose is but in reality you know noses as anyone who draws knows often look like something completely different and, and you reach for metaphors like you know crustaceans or something or it looks like a piece of you know pasta or you know often nothing like what we think a nose is so um but yeah drawing is another one of these great ways of sort of reprogramming your, your brain and looking at the world in, in a different way and of course the more the older we are the more experience we have the deeper those assumptions and and, and you know become um and the predictive brain becomes ever more predictive i think mm -hmm. well look you talked about surfing you talked about chess you talked about drawing singing even uh kind of making rings and jewelry uh, is d after you finished the book, did you, did you start any other things or do you have any other uh, new uh, challenges on the horizon? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think the one thing that this, this did awaken, you know, again, kind of what you mentioned earlier, this, this, just this ability to be a beginner and to be comfortable with that. And uh, I'm not sure that I've gotten any faster at learning, but, but the, the, the willingness is there and, you know, just having a, a kid, of course, always keeps this channel very open. And, and my daughter wanted to take up indoor climbing. We had only done it like once or twice before, but now now we're really at it in earnest. And, and this is something that, yes, I've gone through that whole process again. I've made the beginner mistakes. I My muscles are doing weird things. I'm trying to figure out what look like impossible climbs suddenly become slightly more possible after a few weeks. I mean, you know, that level of desirable difficulty. But, um, and if, I've moved into a house and as any homeowner you know knows there's an endless array of potential projects that you you then decide you know do i want to call in a professional do i want to take at it take a stab at it myself mm -hmm. so i just laid a, a bluestone walkway in our backyard <laughs> and, and this this sent me into you know the deep world of of masonry and and right. stone and uh, all this is you know, incredibly you know exciting and, and energizing i think it just and just uh keeps keeps things you know reveals the continuing wonder of the world around you because you have to engage with it. It's um, yeah. it just gives you yet another level of an engagement with the world rather than the easy thing would be to, to call someone and do that. But, you know, it, I think we, sh we shouldn't always do that. We should just sort of take the slow, slow, hard road once in a while. <laughs> well, this is, this has been a great conversation and I love your approach to individual learning. I think on the institutional side, universities and other learning institutions have to kind of take more of a, lifelong lifelong learning approach right you know we, we we train people for four years or two years and then we just kind of push them out into the world and and uh and and i think there's maybe too much emphasis on uh providing content rather than providing a um you know a capacity for learning that can be uh you know continued after they depart our hallowed halls but but that's yeah, something I'm, I'm hoping to work on I'll just say one point there, which is that my own university career it reflects that a little bit because in terms of where I am today, I mean, I, I spent my time doing my academic work, of course, but a lot of what I was doing in college was working on the student newspaper, which was a very, you know, apprenticeship model where I was actually, you know, writers were paid for their work. We were doing, you know, real reporting, real stories. And that, you know, was, was as much even though it didn't appear on my transcripts or anything, that that was as much a part of my education as the, let's say the you know the the history or the the French theory that I was imbibing at the time, uh, and the, those two things I think fused to get me where I am today, where I, I I'm obviously a writer getting paid for my work, but then I also have this appreciation for you know archival research and 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 you know a, a, academic rigor and footnoting and, and things like that, but. Um, that 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 sort of vocational part that was going on really had it really had a huge influence even even though it doesn't show up you know kind of in an official way well uh this is the book it's beginners uh definitely worth checking out uh, we didn't even get to talk about these other two amazing books uh you may also like i think you should, people should check this out and this one i i mean this is still there's got to be an update. I mean, now with autonomous uh, driving, I do remember you did talk a bit about autonomous driving even back then and how it would 
you know, lead to, you know, greater density of, uh, of cars on the road and so forth. But, you know, there's definitely going to be a whole new, it's got to be a whole new chapter for this book that you've got to, got to, it's been create. on my mind just trying to, yeah, trying to think if there's enough there or the, the right way to do it, but it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's, it's been on my mind. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much, Tom. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 